morning to all of you and greetings from Sri Lanka Medical Association from the historic Vijayaram House. On behalf of SLMA, I welcome all of you who are joining us in person as well as online for the keynote address of the 133rd Anniversary International Virtual Medical Congress. The keynote address will be delivered by Professor T. Thirumurthy from National University of Singapore. Dr. Thiru Thirumurthy currently holds the position of the adjunct professor of Duke NUS University, Singapore, and works as a director in the professionalism development program of the Office of Academic and Clinical Development and in the MD program. He holds the position as the academic director at the Singapore Medical Association, Center for Medical Ethics and Professionalism. Dr. Thirumurthy graduated as a medical doctor from the University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, in 1972 and went on to be trained as internal medicine and dermatology. He holds a master's degree in healthcare ethics and law from the University of Manchester and completed master's in counseling in 2015 in Monash. The keynote address, the topic is challenges in healthcare delivery in the area of professionalism in the new normal. This keynote address title has been selected considering the current challenging situation and the need to move into the new normal. On behalf of SLMA, we warmly welcome and invite Professor Tirmurthy, the keynote address of the Sri Lanka Medical Association 133rd Anniversary International Medical Congress. Over to you, Dr. Tirmurthy. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for that invitation to address the Sri Lankan Medical Association International Medical Congress. Um, the topic as we discuss is really about professionalism and how it is going to impact and I'll make reference to relevance to the new norm in the COVID epidemic. The new norm being really about what happens to the world or to society after a crisis. Now I will, this is the outline of my presentation. And really I will start off with the definition of healthcare professionalism and end up with professionalism in the new norm and beyond. Um, professionalism, one of the issues when we discuss professionalism is people are always asking, what is your definition of your professionalism? Because there is really no universal definition. So to start this discussion this morning, I would share with you a working diagnosis, which we use in the Center for Medical Ethics and Professionalism at the Singapore Medical Association. So our concept is a multidimensional concept, which consists of duties, competencies, behaviors, values, virtues, conduct, outcomes, and relationships. But what is more important is really about achieving what does it achieve? It achieves the goals of medicine and to promote the trust and confidence in the healthcare system. Now, that's where the commonality is. Goals of medicine and the trust of confidence in any form of definition of professionalism. So trust and confidence, as experienced clinicians, you know, are really, are really something, is something that is really essential, is necessary to navigate the complexity, the uncertainty, the volatility, and actually lend stability to the practice of medicine. And therefore, trust and confidence is something that we would want to achieve at all times. And professionalism, therefore, provides us the vehicle to achieve this. The second area of commonality in definition is actually to look at the goals of medicine. So if you look at the goals of medicine, this is as set out in a project by the Hastings Center in New York, which started in early 1990 and published in 1996. So they talk about the prevention of disease and injury, promotion and maintenance of health, the relief of pain and suffering caused by maladies, the care and the cure of the malady and cure, 
care for those who cannot be cured, and then the avoidance of premature death and pursuit of peaceful death. Now, why did they embark on this project? Because in the late 80s and 1990s, there was a rapid and extensive uh, commercialization of medicine. And therefore, they said there has to be a setting of new priorities. And that is really to relook at the goals of medicine. And I think this is international and is acceptable. Let's then come 10 years later. And this is from the goals for the 21st century healthcare organization. And it is from Crossing the Quality Chasm. As you know, this was published in 2001, and this was preceded in 1999 by the Institute of Medicine report on To Err is Human, which for the first time publicly revealed the extent of medical injuries that occur in the care of patients. And therefore, the goals shifted a little bit more in terms of general goals to continuous learning and improvement and patient safety is very high up and the quality domains that actually determine what is good healthcare. Now, we are now in the, a global crisis. We are in a health crisis. It's a global pandemic. And we now may have to relook at our goals again and reprioritize. So it is very clear the priorities at this stage, the public health priorities have become more important than the clinical priorities, which the two previous goals talks about clinical care in hospital or healthcare setting. So here, the integrity of the healthcare system is going to be important, or which the, the most important is to make sure that the healthcare professionals are not infected. And there's no nosocomial transmission of COVID-19 infection within the hospitals. And this is important because that maintains the integrity of the healthcare system. And then, of course, when we have a shift of priority, we would then have to have appropriate management of the limited resources with the rest of the kind of services we need to and continue to provide uh, during the, the pandemic. The other important thing from the pandemic point of view is to reduce morbidity and mortality, the rate of spread of infection, and the extent of spread of infection and minimize morbidity and mortality. At the same time, the public health imperative in the pandemic requires us to extend beyond just the biomedical arena and to realize that the social economic life of the community must continue. What are the measures that we can put into place so that economic life uh, continues and there is a minimization of economic hardship and there's also minimization of social discord and harmony. So you will see that the goals of healthcare, although there are a lot of commonalities, do change for over a period of time in terms of priorities. So if we want something more consistent in terms of the goals, in terms to support this concept of professionalism, let us take a big step further down into really the source of the goals of medicine. In that here, we need to go into the philosophy of medicine. So where do it take us to? So the core of medicine or healthcare actually comes from human suffering, from disease and illness. And I think we accept that this is part of nature. Disease, illness, microbes do exist. But in response to the suffering, all right, and the compassionate response to the suffering is the emergence of the healer. Right, And the healer, as you all know, is there are many types of healers, but we are talking about a healer who is a professional. So the professional who professes to heal is really the person in the middle of healthcare professionalism. And then there is a whole healing process and, out, and outcomes. So this is the practice of medicine. So if we look at the core of medicine, it is really compassion. Compassion in terms of value, compassion in terms of motivation, all right, that drives healthcare professionalism. So when a professional or when a healer wants to be a professional, what are the kind of identities he needs to access or to, to show? So it's clearly clinical competence, all right, expertise. That means doing things right in terms of medical errors, and getting good outcomes. At the same time, when we say doing things right, professionalism gives us the concept of professional standards. 
and our performance measured according to standards. And in the area of conduct, because we want to do good, professional ethics charters codes, which clarify duties, responsibilities of conduct is what we profess to the world, who we are as a professional and a healer. And we are accountable for what we do. So it has a system of accountability and governance. And medicine being an ethical enterprise, wanting to do good, ethical competence of the, of the healer is going to be important. So his values and virtues, and not only doing things right, but doing the right things all the time. And the way we do the right things, we bear it in concept of altruism and service. That means this, the primacy of the service beyond the fruits of the labor. In other words, as a professional, as a healer, we look at the value of our work based on the benefit to society and less so on the economic gains. And because we now understand that medicine is practiced in a community, culture of collaboration is going to be important. And because there is science which is consistently advancing, the culture of continuous improvement is also part of what constitutes the professional identity of a healer. So what I've done in this first presentation is really to get us a clear concept of what do we mean by professionalism and what are the important elements and actually to identify that it is the professional identity of the healer, right, that makes it more effective for current day. I shall now move on to talk about becoming a professional, okay. Now becoming a professional is really about a journey, a journey more than a destination. So a lot of times in education, we quarrel about assessing professionalism, all right? How do we define, how do we measure professionalism? Now, sometimes that takes us away from really, uh, I want to give you a different paradigm to look at. So there is a five years in medical school, there's five years or so in postgraduate training under supervision, and then a 35 years journey. So in medical school, being a novice, becoming advanced beginner, and when you finish your specialist postgraduate training, you're competent, then working towards mastery. We also know that in this journey, education has focused on patient care and medical knowledge. But we know in medical practice, right, interpersonal communication, professionalism, engaging the system for improvement, all right, and practice is far more important. A lot of times in, in, in medical education, there's too much emphasis on the IQ, but we'll find that in medical practice, it's the EQ that's going to be important. So let's look at becoming a professional as a journey, right? Rather than just a destination. It's a five plus five and 35 years of a transformative journey that's shaped over a lifetime career. And what actually shapes this career development or professional development is, is knowledge, is experience, is deep reflection, redefining the beliefs, refining the skills, and being mentored in a community. So community and culture are actually extremely important in the transformative learning process in becoming a professional. So you will ask me, what is the transformative learning? So this is really multi-stage, multi-step, there's a combination of physical, cognitive, emotional, intuitive learning process. Really, the first focus is on self-awareness. Physician, heal thyself before you heal others. Self-examination, social and situational awareness, and continuous learning from critical reflection on experience and on, on oneself and from experience. So in other words, you need to continue to produce knowledge based on experience and use that knowledge as you move forward. There has to be a clear shift of personal beliefs and values from being an individual focus to a patient focus to a society focus, sort of values and beliefs. That is really where we, we profess to uphold the primacy of the patient's welfare above that of the physician and other parties. Now, that's not an easy job that happens overnight. So there has to be a conscious change of behavior and new habits. And all of you are familiar with neuroplasticity. And unlike old, old days, we say old dogs cannot learn new habits. We know that all dogs can learn new habits. 
So there are methods and these kind of transformative learning is what we need to induct into medical education. Now, having covered the definition, having discussed about becoming a professional, now I want to talk a little bit about professionalism beyond the individual. For a long time, we medical school and medical education focus on the individual professional and his morals and his ethics and his competence. No doubt that is still very important. And we need to continue to do that, right? That is the clinical competence and basically the ethical competence of the doctors we train, doing things right and doing the right thing and doing it in a way which is the altruistic motive driven by compassion for fellow human beings. No doubt this we need to continue to educate and emphasize, but equally important to recognize that a professional who is ethically competent and clinically competent and altruistic cannot function effectively when a system does not support the culture and the governance of good professionalism. So what I want to emphasize in the next few slides is about the need for us to look at organizational professionalism. Healthcare organization, medical professional organization, and what is our professionalism? So I share with you a definition, a working definition, not a perfect definition, of healthcare organizational professionalism. So is healthcare organizational professionalism it encompasses values, principles, strategies, organizational strategies, culture, competencies, and outcomes that aims to achieve the vision and mission of the organization and the goals of medicine and promote the, um, the trust and confidence in the healthcare organization. So it is very similar. We borrowed it, but we have to then look at it. Trust and confidence is very clear. The goals, we will talk about a little bit clearer because they have to align with the medical goals, but some of the features may be different. So when we look at healthcare professionalism, what are the kind of areas we need to look at? We need to look at the vision, mission, and values right, of the organization. They don't just stay there on the website or be stuck on the wall. It has to be internalized and shared by all stakeholders let us look at professional culture. We need to know that culture is extremely important, right? Because if the culture itself is not professional and does not promote humanistic values, we find that the professionalism will die. Governance is very important. How are we dealing with unprofessional medical practice? Do we stand, turn a blind eye? Do we consciously promote and sustain the six quality domains? then are we appropriately putting the resources to support the practice of humanistic medicine? And finally, in organizational professionalism, and I'll come back to talk on this topic, organizational leadership is a key. And basically, the organizational leadership is really what aligns the mission, vision, values, operations, policies, making the resources available and actually starts this whole process of the journey of healthcare organizational professionalism. So you will tell me many healthcare organizations are private healthcare organizations. Now how can they actually harmonize that, all right, to medical professionalism? So I offer you a, a certain concept of what we call the medical entrepreneurship linked to social entrepreneurship. In other words, medicine is really a social enterprise. And therefore, the organizational mission and vision, although it may have a motive to make money, the primary aim is actually the social outcome and enterprise. So the leadership should take a culture of servant leadership. Organizational policies and practices aligned to healthcare ethics and professional values. Value-added quality of care, basically patient-centered, and care and governance, transparency in the management of conflicts of interest. And this is very important because if we are going to have a profit motive, that's perfectly fine. But what is important to develop trust is actually transparency. 
And this transparency specifically has to be on ethical pricing, which takes all stakeholders. If we do not take all stakeholders, the healthcare organization cannot be sustainable. And ethical marketing and advertising is something that's important because this is where a lot of exploitation is potentially possible in the vulnerable uh, patient. So what I'm trying to put forward here is that even though it may be privately owned, even though one of the important interests of this organization is to return uh, profits to shareholders, we can still find a balance. And in fact, what I will show you is that it will be much more sustainable when the private healthcare organization takes on a social entrepreneurship. And there are many successful social entrepreneurships which returns profits to their stakeholders and shareholders. So what are the benefits of organizational professionalism? And there is empirical evidence to support this. There's increased patient and community trust in the organization. And basically improved patient safety, satisfaction and overall health outcomes. So you get good outcomes. At the same time, the economic performance and reputation actually improves. And all of you know, medicine is a word of mouth business and your reputation is extremely important for sustainability. And then of course, in an organization where many staff are now under burnout, emotional and, and, and uh, uh, exhaustion, physical exhaustion, staff morale increases, and engagement retention improves and actually helps the organization. And organizational uh, professionalism supports an environment of conducive learning for conducive improvement in a, a strong culture of psychological safety. So I've covered the aspect. So when we look at it in summary, what should healthcare professionalism look like in the new normal beyond, right? When we have this pandemic and it's settled, how should we go forward? We should look at trustworthiness index. Patient safety is number one. Integrity throughout the operations and policies and practices. Patient-centered, transparency, accountability, especially when things go wrong, and reliability in terms of results and performance. Now, I will move in to talk about two other points, having covered the definition, how to the becoming process of a professional, and the importance of actually in the new normal to talk about organizational professionalism together with individual professionalism. Now, this is a very old challenge in professionalism that is going to exist forever, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic. And this is really finding the balance between commercial interests and political interests. Medicine is big. Medicine is advances. Medicine is good science. Medicine is beautiful. And because it is big, beautiful, People want to exploit it. They want to kidnap it or they want to court it. So money, it is easy to make money out of medicine because patients are at their most vulnerable stage. It is easy to make money because there is a gap in the knowledge and experience between the providers and the patients. Therefore, although commercial interests are important, we have to make sure that it is so it is always managed with medical interest being above the commercial interest. So they can coexist. So is the political interest. We now know today elections can be won and lost on healthcare issues because public expectations around healthcare have become very important. So I think what is important is to realize that we cannot get rid of this entity of commercialization Neither can we get rid of the entity of a project of a political hijack of the health agenda. What we have to realize is really to re-emphasize that medicine to be effective, to be sustainable, has to be an ethical, social, and human ent humanitarian enterprise. And we can live together with the commercial interests and the political interests. But it is important for both the healthcare leadership and the whole profession actually to appreciate and have a clear commitment and conviction through our practices 
That means to say, when we practice ethical medicine, we practice humanistic medicine, we really find the results are better than otherwise. If we don't believe in that, then I think we're going to have this trouble and very often either commercialization or the political agenda as often takes over medicine and medical interests are subsumed. So I think this is something that we need to continuously uh, be aware and develop leadership skills to actually manage this. And this is what I'm going to talk about in the next segment. So this is the last topic that I would like to share with you. Professionalism in the new normal and beyond. The new normal, what are we going to do after this crisis? The crisis is not over. And I want to talk about developing leaders in medicine. Now, if you look at the progress of medicine over the last 60 years, in terms of science, in terms of technology, in terms of surgical treatment, in terms of cancer treatment, in terms of vaccines, the knowledge we have, all right, is extremely high. But we know and can do. But what we actually are doing and what we're actually achieving, there is a gap. And why do I say this? You look at this report, which is about 10 years old. It's published in The Lancet. Many of you would have read this 30-page report on healthcare professionals for a new century. So we talk about healthcare, and this is written by an, an eminent group of leaders in healthcare education across the different parts of the globe. See, they talk about healthcare systems are struggling to keep up because of the complexity and cost and placing stressful demands of healthcare workers. We talk about 30, 50% burnout in healthcare workers. Professional education has not kept pace with the challenges and it's because it's fragmented, outdated with a static curriculum producing ill-equipped graduates. So really there's a mismatch of the competency of the healthcare professionals that we are producing to the patient and population needs because it is evolving. We are still not into good teamwork where doctors have to lead teams and teams are necessary because treatment is complex nowadays. The consistent my low biomedical focus, sorry, narrow biomedical focus is a major problem because medicine needs social and behavioral science knowledge and skills. But what is really the important point that this report emphasizes is actually the weak leadership to be able to respond to these changes of the complexity. So what we need to do with this is that to fill this gap, we need transformative leaders and leadership to fill this gap and leaders who can then basically create the culture and the governance structure to really close this gap. And how shall we go with this? So really the question about transformative healthcare leadership, we need to embrace the concept and create a basically a deliberate effort to develop leaders. So a leadership that articulates a compelling narrative of the mission, vision, and values. A leadership that motivates, develops, and improves. I think that's a very important point. Develop and improve healthcare change. It has to be a change agency, uh, basically in terms of the culture, but also in terms of acquisition of resources. So a deliberate program to develop healthcare leadership as leaders in, uh, uh, is important in the journey of professional development. Leadership is not a box in the organizational structure. Leadership has to be at the clinical level, delivering and improving care, at the professional level in terms of education and research and governance, at the organizational level to sustain and achieve the goals of medicine, but also today in this world crisis, we need to recognize one health Healthcare for all humanities, animals, plants, and the environment in an interdependent world. And we need doctors to move into these areas of leadership. We need to have deliberate programs to develop the leadership. So in my final two slides, I would really like to share with you this prose, uh, which talks about the boss and the leader. The boss drives people, the leader inspires people. The boss depends on authority. The leader depends on expertise and goodwill. The boss says I. The leader says we. The boss shows who is wrong. 
the leader finds what's wrong and helps to fix it. The boss evokes fear. The leader evokes empathy. The boss demands respect. The leader displays and commands respect. I think as most doctors, we are familiar with the concept of the boss. But what we need in the new normal healthcare is actually leaders. And this prose is my gift to the future leaders of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. And my final slide, the doctor as a leader, really, I want to share this thought that for, doc for leaders in medicine who are not particular of who gets the credit or the title, they have no limit to what they can achieve or what you can achieve. And this is my gift to Professor Indika and the selfless leaders of the Sri Lankan Medical Association. And with that, I thank you for the honor and privilege of making this presentation in your Congress. And thank you very much and Namaskar. Thank you, Professor Tirumurthy, for that very insightful keynote address, which befits the theme of this year's International Anniversary Medical Conference, the healthcare enhancement and professional development beyond COVID-19. So you have shown the value of transformative leadership and the need for professionalism. Thank you very much for joining us from Singapore. Let's thank Prof. Tirumurthy again in a traditional way. <laughs>